Thank you, everyone. Um, can you hear me OK? Cool. Um, yeah, as John mentioned, I came in at um, 2.30 um, last night. But before then, I had another red eye, which was from Perth to Melbourne. So I've only slept three hours in two days. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for coming in. And John, you have woken the crowd uh, on Friday morning, so it really helps, sort of. Uh, <laughs> now you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, look, what I wanted to do is just do um, like a quick five minute story, um, how I actually started. Um, and then if we can do a bit more interactive, um, if you want to ask me any questions, um, anything about startups, business models, um, IP protection, I'm not a lawyer or an accountant. They're more capable people in the room, so you can ask them. Where's Ross? Yep, here he is. Um, he's my accountant. Um, don't hassle me. <laughs> um, so here we go. Five minute story. So my background is I'm a. So can you hear me? Okay, Re recording. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so my background is I'm a software engineer, so a bit of a nerd. Um, I was working on a mine site where a project manager said to me, you know, um, we keep losing materials. Um, can you help? And because I was working on a mine site doing fly in, fly out, my response was, ah, I think I already have a system. And obviously the project manager response was, you're kidding, who are you? No one knows you. I want a system which is used by you know, big companies like SAP, Oracle. Um, so he said, go look for a solution. I want a solution which is an ideal solution. And he had like a certain criteria. So for example, he wanted the system must do barcoding, it should do GPS, it should do GPS tracking. Um, must be easy to use, easy to train, affordable. So it's got like certain criteria. So we found a solution, but unfortunately, you know, um, so that was his criteria, known system, barcode, GPS tracking, easy to implement, easy to use. So when we looked for a solution, um, the solution was a million dollars just for that project. And it would take eight months to implement. So obviously, the project manager response was, the client is not going to pay for it. So he had a, another brilliant idea. Um, he was thinking in his mind that he was thinking outside the box. He said, use spreadsheets. So you know what happened with spreadsheets, right? They multiply. So, <laughs> so what happened is he said to me, you are Mr. IT guru. Why don't you create a spreadsheet template, send it to the guys on site, and make sure they input the data. And when it's time for reporting, project reporting, just give me the data so I can send it to the client for progress claims, and we can get paid. Happy days. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like this. So I send a template to the guys on site, um, and at the end of the week, we had about seven sheets. Um, project manager called the guys and said, guys, you can't keep multiplying and copying and pasting these sheets into different copies. I want to consolidate one. So he said to me, make sure they don't copy. I told the guys, make sure you don't copy. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what happened? Next, three weeks later, the nightmare begins. He had 21 sheets in three weeks. The project was about 102 weeks. And so I went back to the project manager and I said, there were a lot of heated debates. <laughs> Everyone was blaming each other. Um, and, you know, finger pointing, you didn't record it. My spreadsheet is better than yours. I've got a more colorful spreadsheets. I've got uh, more, you know, my formulas are better than yours. There's a lot of these things going on. And I was working on a, doing fly in, fly out. You can see I was losing weight. Um, <laughs> but I still had hope, you know? So thinking outside, this is my thinking outside the box. I thought, what should I do? So 
I went back to the project manager and I said to him, look, why don't you use my software? I'll give it to you for free, but I will own the IP and copyright. So that sort of got me started and you know, our solution was quite simple. Um, so thinking outside the box, the way the solution works, and it's quite simple. Every time you scan something, we captured who did it because you're logged in. When it was done, we captured the timestamp. Where it was done, we captured the GPS coordinates of the phone, of the device, um, and what action was taking place. So with one scan, you're capturing four or five different data points. And that goes into a cloud-based solution. And this is talking about like, you know, before 2014, the cloud was still new, especially in, in mining and construction industry. So that sort of worked really well. And what I did was I spent a lot of time spending with st different stakeholders understanding their problems and what each stakeholder wants. So we had project managers, project controllers, planners, material controllers, people who work in stores, everyone wants different things. And initially when I went to the project manager, he said he wants the system to do this. He gave me in writing, this is what he wants. I asked him, if I give you this, would you be happy? He said, yes. I gave him what he asked for and he wasn't happy. <coughs> because what happened is the customers don't know what they want. And when you give them the solution, they, it gets them thinking. So it's not that they're being dishonest. It's just because it, it makes them think, oh, what, are, what about this, what about that, what about that? So and it, you keep improving their product. So a good, honest customer, or a good customer is going to help you improve your product. So it's quite frustrating, but you have to nurture them. So in the end, what happened was where everyone was finger pointing. Um, he was quite happy. By the way, this is stock photos. He's not the actual project manager. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, so, you know, he gave me thumbs up. Um, we received really, really good feedback. The feedback from the project director was that it's the only project he has worked on where he did not have to refabricate or reorder something. So what happened is when the project manager left the, the project, he went on to other big projects and he said to me, Kash, if I want to use your system. And, um, and just through word of mouth, we now are working on more than 50 projects. We received some really good testimonials. And that's my five minute story. So what I wanted to share with you is what I think um, is the reason or some of the things what I learned along the way. Um, so what do you need to succeed? Um, how many people, obviously, just um, by show of hands, how many people own your own business or startup or pretty much everyone, right? Um, and when you start a company, and you know, people who have previously started the businesses, they know as a business owner or as an entrepreneur, you usually feel like this, <laughs> right? So you're like, doesn't matter, we'll just, you know, we are right. Um, you, you believe in something and then that just is the one which drives you. However, you have to be flexible and you need to understand that what will make you successful is if you can be the best in that particular field. So if you're passionate about something, you want to make sure that can you be the best in that particular criteria? Because there are a lot of people who are doing similar things to you. If you, ha if you think you've got a very unique idea and no one has thought of it, trust me, there is a ch very good chance that it's a shit idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, so there are people who have thought of all these ideas, but it's not about the idea, it's can you be the best at that particular thing which you're passionate about? 
and passion is the one which will drive you, right? So if it's something that gets you excited, you need to find that. Um, and the next one is you need a good business model. So fantastic, you've got a really good business idea. Um, you can be the best at, you really love it, you think about it, you dream about it, um, you live it, you talk to everyone about it, but how are you gonna make money off it? So that's something which you'll have to think because eventually the passion will try to go down. You need, at some stage, you will need to raise money, feed the kids, feed the family. So you need to think about what is going to be a business model. How are you going to make money off your grand idea? And the next one is faith. Faith is different for different people. Um, um, can be God or creator or whatever you want to believe in. So aliens um, or, you know, this because what happened or believe in yourself. So what happened is that, you know, as a very famous philosopher of our times, Mike Tyson um, said that everyone has a plan till they get punched on the face. So, uh, <laughs> so what happened is, what happened is that of all, when, when you think that you've got all the ideas, everything is running smoothly, you've passed all the hurdles, you've got your you know, product or solution or the business, and then nothing will go wrong, something will go wrong. There is always going to go, something is going to wrong, go wrong at every stage of your business. Whether it's the starting, um, your, you have issues with your founding members, um, your key employee quit, um, you get sued by someone, or it could be anything. So in the end, it's about sometime you win and sometimes you learn, so you never lose. So just make sure that whatever happens to you, if you know, it either is positive or it's negative in your mind, but those negative things are a lessons learned. What can you get out of it? And I've made thousands of mistakes, right? And, and each mistake, um, could have killed the business. But you, you learn and you make sure that you don't make the same mistakes again because that's just crazy. So, sorry, this thing didn't come up. Um, the next one is something that sort of really helped me um, because, I'm not, and now I'm talking about from um, my product point of view, um, that really helped me was um, IP protection. And again, um, this is informational only. Um, take your own legal advice. All the disclaimers that come with it. Don't sue me. <laughs> um, and my opinions are my own and I've got lots of them. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that sort of helped me was um, patents. So, um, and patents are complicated. Um, the, the lessons from that was, um, you know, you need to look at um, what is important to others, not you. So it's not about you, the product you're going to build or the solution you're going to provide to the customer is not to yourself. It's so easy to get carried away with, oh, this is my product and everyone's gonna love it. Um, but if it's not gonna help your customer or the end user, no one's gonna buy it. So you need to understand what is important to others and that's what you need to protect. So I'm just talking about IP production. Educate yourself. Um, you need to understand your product and what you're going to protect more than your lawyer or more than the person who is giving you advice because no one knows 
more than what you do. So try doing some patent searches. Um, find an attorney friend. I know it's a, what do you call that? You know, um, oxymoron. Um, <laughs> so, so, are there any lawyers here? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, find an attorney friend. Um, look, I had, I had a friend, he sort of gave me, pointed me into the right direction, um, which, was, which was really helpful. Um, and get used to rejections. So my patent story is um, I went to a patent lawyer um, and I said to him, look, you know, this is my great idea. We, because one of the things which we wanted to do is to, you know, we've got this asset register which we are capturing in the field. We wanted to link, we link that into a 3D model. So it's pretty cool. The way it works is you have a 3D model and you can actually color code this, the, the items as they move through supply chain. Um, what is the status of them in like red, blue, yellow, green? So you see it in 3D model. What is the status of your project? So I had this idea. I went to the, went to the, my first lawyer, uh, patent lawyer, and I said to him, do you know, what do you think of this idea? And his response was, well, this is too generic. You're not going to get patent on it. So, um, and I just keep getting used to reje rejection. So I said to him, thank you very much, sir. Move to the next one. So one of the things I learned is when someone says no, you say next, right? So when someone says no, so it, and it works in different circumstances. So it could be when your customer says no, you go next, right? When the investors who wants to invest in your business, he says no, you go next. So you keep doing that. Um, so anyway, so I keep doing that to my lawyer, went to the next one, he said no, I said next. <laughs> so finally, I found a really good um, lawyer. Um, she looked at my patent, uh, uh, like the application, and she said, yeah, I think you are onto something. We have filed for the patent. We've got a patent in Australia and the US, and that really helped us. But um, file as fast as you can. But most importantly, patent is not everything. You know, it's it's just a piece of paper. Um, it just basically protects you in case if something goes wrong, especially if you if you have if you are going to get investors on board. At least they know that you have some idea, which is worth protection. That's all. Um, there are a lot of patents who are just patents and there's no product around them. So focus on the product, not just the patent. Things like copyright, make sure that um, you know, your trademarks and copyright. Question. Sure. Have you had to protect or defend your patents at all? Because patents are only really as valuable as your ability to defend it. Yeah, so that's. Um, that's one thing which we are sort of looking for. Um, that if there are, we know that there are some people who are in breach of our patent. So you just have to be careful how you are going to defend your patent as well. Um, and that requires a lot of cost, time, and resources. So the goal is to get the protection. And if you don't have the protection, you can't protect it. Um, and you can, where we, we saw the advantage of the patent was when you go to the customers, you can say, look, we've got a patent on this, and it just basically proved that you've got something which is unique, and you've got something which is innovative. And you are thinking about protection. So it's not about, you know, just a patent, it's about what your thinking process is. So be careful if you are, especially if people who write their software or you're writing any content, make sure that you think of your trademarks and copyright. Um, when I started my product, I called it MCDB, which was a pretty crappy name. It was Material Control Database. So that's my software engineer who came up with this idea. Um, then I moved to ProTracker and the feedback from the customers was like, oh, it's just, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, um, and then we stuck on TrackM and we might have to rebrand it again. But just, just, just think about what, 
what you're going to call your product, do some search, you know, if there is any .com domains um, available or not, because if you're going to expand globally, you would need a .com domain. So th these are the things which you'll have to be mindful of before you jump the gun. Um, some subcontractors, contracts and NDAs um, is quite useful. Um, quite often what happens is that you get carried away, oh, look, I've got this brilliant idea. Um, you know, you get a subcontractors to start working on this product. And when the subcontractors see, oh, you know, it's got some uh, potential. And if you have not protected your relationship with him, then that is going to come and bite you on the backside. Um, so just make sure that you have your contracts and NDAs in place. Um, my final slides, a um, few things um, which I really believe in um, is values, know yourself. Um, you need to understand that what do you value for yourself. So is it health, family, um, getting, um, uh, some people like certainty, some people like uncertainty. So you need to understand what is that drives you and what is that you value. And if what you personally value is in conflict with what you are trying to do, it's never going to work. Um, business models, again, as I mentioned, how are you going to sell it, how the customer is going to pay for it, this is something which you need to work on. Um, lessons learned from sales. Again, as I mentioned, when the customer says no, you say next. Cool. Um, just on sales, one of the things you have to understand is that um, I was, sales is not my thing. So, but people as founder or as the business owner, people don't buy your product, they buy your passion, right? So when you go in and they'll, you basically, I wanted to sell it even if it's for free, right? Because I wanted to solve that problem. Um, and then when you, the, the challenge becomes is when you hire your first salesperson, how are you going to transfer that passion into him or your company? And then you have to systemize you, you can't, the, that's the unfortunate thing, is that you can't have transferred that full passion, 100% passion into your salespeople. So you need to systemize your sales process to make sure that your product is sellable. When to slice the pie? So um, another thing I learned quite late was you need to raise money to scale the business. And if you want to, if you want to go to that path, um, as the famous saying goes, um, that you can have a big piece of a small pie or a small piece of a big pie. So quite often, the small piece of a big pie is bigger than a big piece of a small pie. Does that make sense? And I'm, I'm still, yeah, we had some um, interesting discussion and um, my last visit to Melbourne, which sort of was contradicting to what I'm saying. Someone gave me that feedback, but anyway. That's a talk for another time. Um, another thing, how to deal with your baby is ugly. So, <laughs> uh, so people are going to say, oh, this is a shit product. Uh, oh, sorry, can I say the shit word here? Okay. Uh, <laughs> It's a bit too late, but uh, um, so look, what's, what, what happened is that, you know, you've got this product, you really love it, and you know, you, you will, you'll find a customer who will say, oh, you know, I really like it, and, but quite often you'll find customers who will basically, oh, no, this is really crap, or it's not going to work, so you need to understand that, you know, how do you go past that? How do you go that first past that first rejection and understand why they don't like it and try to drill more into it. That what is that is bothering them? What is that they don't like? Um, yeah, it is quite painful when people say that your baby is ugly. Um, I mean, from a product point of view. Um, the other thing was that always, and 
And if you are building a product or writing something or creating something, um, it's very tempting to fall in love with that thing which you are creating because it's your creation. So don't fall in love with that. Fall in love with the solution or the problem which the customer has so that you can provide them that solution. So fall in love with the solution, not the product. Um, and when to raise capital and how much. Um, again, if you are going to go on that journey, just make sure you have the end in mind, what you're going to do, how much at each stage, when you're going to raise it. Um, and company structures. Make sure you talk to a good lawyer, good accountant, how you're going to structure it. If you're going to claim R&D grants, um, make sure your company is set up that way that you can claim it. Um, and get some good advisors on board. And that's pretty much it. Translation, well done, some great one lines there. Wow, <laughs> it's just particularly like uh, uh, how to deal with your baby when it's ugly, I guess. <laughs> so, yes, some great one lines. Let me just read out some of the ones that I uh, picked up. Everyone has a plan. Uh, until you get punched in the face. I thought that was just really good. And, and so many business owners around the room, I know we've been punched in the face so many times. Uh, that's just part of doing business. Uh, sometimes you win, and then sometimes you learn. I thought that was really good. If you have a great idea, it's a shit one. And <laughs> so many business owners, they oh, you know, I've got this great idea. And then you go, yeah, okay. Um, uh, People buy your passion, without a doubt. Um, you know, the, the business owners in the room today, that's what you buy. You can actually have a crap business model, but you can still have a good business. You can have a crap strategy, but if you've got the passion, you can actually drive it to make a successful business. Um, one of the questions which I really want to uh, interrogate it relates to, and I know there are a number of people in the room at the moment that are making that change uh, as to whether they actually sell part of their business in order to raise capital. So I wouldn't mind you just going through that process and your thought process, how you work through that. So look, um, um, if you're, there are different ways of raising capital. Either you sell portion of your business or you raise money using issuing more shares. So I would um, assume that you are asking the similar question, so it's the same thing. Look, it's, um, it's quite tough um, if you don't understand what you actually want to achieve. Because what happened is that if you want to raise more money, um, you need to understand why you want to raise your money, why you want to raise money. Is it to scale the business? Um, or is it you want to just make money so that you can buy a Ferrari? So um, it, really, it really depends. I assume that you want to sell or you want to raise money so that you can scale the business. Um, if you want to scale the business, you need to understand that you cannot do it on your own. You need to hire more people. You need to hire a good team, good management team and you can't do it um, on your own. And that's why you need to raise money. Most of the money is raised. These days, I'm talking from a product and or a software point of view, is usually to hire a good team. So, and one of the reasons we raise money is so that we can hire good people. Great, excellent. So, question through, uh, yes, or just on that, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Have you know, models for valuing a business, and because you know, um, uh, you know, often you're in that sort of startup and you're investing, you know, whatever you're making back into yeah. further. So I mean, often, what I'm is not that great, yeah. but obviously revenue is growing. I mean, what's what should be your experience in terms of how people look at your business or value your business? Yeah, look, the um, the one of the th advice I can give you is raise money when you don't need it. Um, and as soon as, because what happened is that once the 
once people know that you need money, then they will sense it. And it's unbelievable how they can sense it. It just comes across. Doesn't matter how, if you are a Hollywood actor, um, you, can, you cannot fake that. People will know that you are desperate and they will use it. Everyone wants a good deal. Um, and it's raising money in, in, I have to be careful what I'm saying. Um, raising money in Perth and WA is difficult. So you just have to bear that, and but it's not impossible. What about Australia generally? I mean, is that is it the same compared to the US or you know, uh, overseas? The, the thing is, like, um, the hardest bit is you guys have already done it. You've started the business or, you know, you've, you've done something. So that's the hardest bit. Um, raising, money, it's, raising money is difficult because if someone is giving you their hard-earned cash, or their money to because they want to believe in you. So you have to understand what is their driver and why they want to give the money to you. And if they are giving you the money because, and, you, and this is really important because you, if someone is investing in your business, you need to make sure that they are, they, they have the same um, focus and they have the same end goal um, than you. Uh, as as you have, because uh, if they are going in a different way, or if they just want to flip your company, or if they want to just do a quick transaction, then or if they want to do a takeover, so just you have to be mindful of that why they want to invest, and um, and if they are singing the same song as you are. Um, just when you started this, were you just a sole programmer? And if so, how did you find sort of the challenges of scaling that by bringing other programmers into your project? Um, look, to be honest, when I um, when I started the 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 product, or I didn't actually realize that it's gonna it's gonna get that big. Um, um, well, you know, our hope is that we will be the next Atlassian or the next big unicorn. Um, that's that's the that's the vision, um, but you need to you need to uh, as I mentioned about passion, you need to infect um, that passion or that virus, the good virus, um, into into your team, and that's why culture is so important. So as a founder or as a leader or as a business owner, that culture. You need to maintain that culture because the founding team or the initial programmers or whoever you're going to hire are going to be your key people who will drive that culture in the business. So you need to make sure that you hire good people. Um, and one other thing we have, we have a saying in our business that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So culture is that important. Um, if someone, as we have um, a no idiot policy, um, we have a different one, but uh, because it's being recorded, I'll just say no idiot policy. Um, so, <laughs> um, so basically, if some, it doesn't matter how good, um, what, uh, how good someone is, if it's the best salesperson, or if it's the best developer, if he's being bully, or if he's being an idiot, or if he's not behaving as what we believe in, then he will get fired. Simple as that. And to? Yes. Um, one other thing which we strongly believe in, hire slow and fire fast. Uh, good question. What time of time frame were you looking at when you first started like MC, BB to project? <laughs> when did you really see the growth of the business happening? I think the the first uh, you know first initial months or the first project, I was just focused on the on the product. Um, so if you think about the journey, was you look at the problem, you create a solution, the solution turned into a product, and the product turned into a company. So that's sort of like it takes time, you know. It's and there is you know there are some and 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 unfortunately we see a lot of you know hype and news around. Uh, things like, oh, Instagram did it in 12 months, or it's X amount of companies did it in, you know, six years. 
So everyone has got unique circumstances, you've got your unique challenges, um, so just take your time, um, but once you've got your product, then it's just how fast you can grow. Uh, thanks for sharing your time, Smile. I think it's really, really interesting. And my questions are about pricing. Um, you mentioned you made, made a lot of mistakes. And one of the things that it's practically impossible to get right is pricing software first time around. Now, yeah. Can you do a bit of Oh, look, um, uh, from a pricing point of view, we've tried so many different models. So because we are providing asset tracking solution, so we tried number of users, um, so you pay per user, it's a quite standard one. We tried um, paying by number of assets you are tracking. Um, we tried different models, but nothing sort of worked. And now what we are sort of getting to is, how can we get more network effect? How can we get more people to use it? And what we found is if you're charging per user, what happened is that people start sharing their user <laughs> logins and it corrupts the data. Um, and then if you do uh, charge by number of assets, then people don't track this thing, so it's gonna cost me to track it. So what we did is we basically said, you've got like small, medium, large, or you've got gold, um, uh, pl gold, platinum, diamond, or you know whatever package you want to call it. So you can have three different packages, small, medium, large, and then you basically say, you go for, you know, go for your life, how much you want to use it. So the more people use it, the better system gets. So that's what we found is quite useful for us. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you talk about the culture and how it's in the When you're recruiting people, how do you, do you have any tips? Um, yeah, look, it's, it's um, the, the tip I can give is that um, I interview, um, so I have like really good team, so Andrew is um, our executive general manager at Trackham, he recently joined us. Um, so he helped us doing the first filtering, um, he knows what our criteria is, so he's a really good filter. And once after that, I do the final interview, we check. And again, you never know, you know, people, the, you know, interviews are just, you know, people in there are usually either in their best behavior um, or they're really nervous. So you can't really judge someone by interviewing, um, interviewing them. So you just have to do a bit of, um, you know, a, a sort of a leap of faith. You try them out and if they don't work out, just let them go. Uh, because it's not fair on them and it's not fair on you and it's not fair on your staff. Um, yeah, I hope that answers. So I, I, unfortunately, I don't have like a quiz which I can give it to them and say, oh yeah, you know, you, this is your, you, you fit the, um, you know, like a Myers-Briggs test, so we don't, we don't have that yet. Uh, what is your journey as an entrepreneur to like a business owner? Did you, while you were a software engineer, did you always believe this, you always want to be, a business owner or just one day you just see a problem and just go, I think I can fix that and then I can go again? Um, I don't know. Look, um, the, I, I, I don't have the answer for that. Um, like how and when I got infected with this entrepreneurship bug. I don't, I don't call myself, generally call myself entrepreneur. I'm just, I like solving problems. I like helping people, I like talking to the customers, I like my team, I love my work, and it just happened to be that I'm managing so many different people. So I don't, I don't look at it as that I'm an entrepreneur and I've won few awards, it's just, yeah, that's, that's my luck. And the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, just one more question. Yeah. You mentioned when you, um, you know, that your staff is probably your key asset and that um, when you're trying to um, infuse your corporate culture and the passion into your staff that you're trying to put <coughs> systems in place to sort of, I guess, cook cut your staff into yourself. Did you do that or did you get other people to assist you? Um, look, it's it's the teamwork. So you you work with your team. We didn't have any external con contractors who came in and said, you know, this is your culture and use that because that's just going to be. I don't think that's going to work. But you know, I might be wrong. 
but what we found is that you have to work together as a team to work out what is your DNA and then go with that. So. Uh, we might just uh, wrap it up there. I, one of the sayings there is never fall in love with the acid, which I guess is a, is a negative. And you turned it into a positive by saying, what was it? Uh, uh, fall in love with the solution. Mm. So, uh, and I had a business where I fell in love with the acid and lost many millions of dollars. So maybe if I'd met you earlier, I'd <laughs> So, uh, can you please thank him? He's just going to